35 years ago at this time, the San Gabriel Valley was gripped by fear. It was a very hot summer, much like the one we're having now, and the uncomfort was made worse by a serial killer who was hitting all too close to home. No matter if you were a kid at this time or an adult, you probably have very vivid memories of the situation. No matter if you were a kid at this time or at that time or an adult, you probably have very, uh, very many stories about how the Night Stalker directly affected you. The Night Stalker. The summer of the Night Stalker. 1985. That's what we're here to talk about today on the Aram on Everything podcast. There was no cute musical intro today because this is a very serious topic. The victims were people just like all of us and many of them lived right near all of us. You probably drive by their houses today and don't even know it. I will be joined today by true crime writer Frank Gerardo to discuss, relive, and ask questions about the Night Stalker. But beyond the discussion you hear today, I want things to continue. I want any of you who have feedback and memories to share them with me and Frank in the thread that I start on Twitter that goes along with this podcast. You can follow me on Twitter at Chemical AT. At Chemical AT, just how it sounds. Further, this podcast is making a plea today to any surviving victims or family family members of victims or friends of victims who want to come forward and direct message me on Twitter if you'd like, and I will try to make an episode, if I can, about each individual slaying or crime. It won't be easy, but if I get enough info, I can do it. That's my plea to you guys today. Um, this would be not all about their death, but more about their life. Um, as I mentioned a few moments ago, I'm very, very happy to be joined today by Frank Gerardo. Um, I worked with him many years at your uh, favorite local newspapers uh, of the Southern California Newspaper Group. Um, he is a former San Gabriel Valley Tribune reporter uh, and editor, now author of four best-selling true crime books, all of which are available on Amazon, so get on there and, and check out his books. Uh, they are Betrayal in Blue, which is uh, also a Netflix documentary, and Burned, uh, which is about a Glendale fire captain turned serial arsonist and murderer. Uh, but for the sake of today, Frank is going to be having a conversation with me about the Night Stalker. And I ask at this time, Frank Gerardo, are you there? Hello, Aaron, and hi, everybody listening to uh, this great podcast. I'm very really happy to be here. Thanks for yeah, having me. Yeah, we're very happy to have you. I mean, obviously, um, uh, you know, this is your uh, this is your area of expertise, um, true crime. Uh, and, boy, it, it never felt truer than in the summer of 1985. Um, Frank, uh, like I said during the intro, you know, everybody has a personal story about, uh, about the Night Stalker. Um, everybody kind of remembers where they were. Um, so let's ask you, where were you uh, summer of 1985 and what was going through your head? That great, great way to start this question, because I think everybody that lives in Southern California remembers that summer. If you were an adult, and I certainly was, um, at the beginning of the year in the spring, I lived in Long Beach, but um, I moved to Pomona. Uh, and, um, I had, a, at that time I was doing a bunch of different jobs. One of them was working as a salesman at a guitar center. And another one was, uh, selling, um, room additions and patio covers, uh, in the San Gabriel Valley. And I actually mm -hmm. started that job in July of 85, about the time that the Night Stalker was really, um, heating up and, and hitting homes in the San Gabriel Valley. Yeah. And I have to tell you, it was a hot summer. And uh, it was a terrifying summer because you didn't know who the victims, you know, why he was choosing certain victims, why, you know, and the terrible thing about it was that not just that he was choosing these people at random or seemingly so, is that it didn't just happen in one place or a couple of places that were close together. 
there were crimes that happened in uh, Glendale, Monterey Park, Monrovia, and Diamond Bar. So, you know, you're covering a lot of territory uh, for a lot of, and even down in Whittier. Um, I was thinking about this the other night, too, in a different way. You know, it was about 100 degrees the other night. I mean, it was sweltering, yep. even after the sun went down. And, uh, you know, typically at night, you know, it's hot like that. You know, I like to open the window. And after getting, you know, sort of tickled about the Night Stalker story, I double fought. You know, I like stopped mm-hmm. a second and thought, man, do I want to sleep with the window open tonight? You know? And then yeah. that brought back that whole rush of memories, I think, that people that were here that summer uh, really uh, remember. Uh, later on, of course, and I'm sure we'll talk about this uh, in your in the podcast here. You know, I became a reporter a couple of years later and worked at the Herald Examiner. Sure. Um, uh, after uh, he was arrested and then tried, um, and you know, became friends with some of the detectives in the corners on the case. So, um, uh, there's some interesting stuff to talk about here, Aaron. Interesting yes, stuff. yes, there is interesting stuff to talk about, and. You know, Frank, for me, the mark of a good documentary or a good podcast um, is its ability to, to dig up nuggets that that maybe people didn't know about. And I'm hoping you bring some today. Um, I know I have a couple. Um, I thought I was completely, uh, oh, I guess, uh, completely versed in this situation. But as I find out, there's more uh, that I didn't know. Um, and I'm starting to think, Frank, that the reason for that is because this investigation, while it was ongoing, while the Night Stalker was out committing the crimes, so much of the information was kept uh, private and quiet by law enforcement. Not only were there several law enforcement agencies working on this, which actually turned out to be a bad thing, but Frank, so much was kept quiet or tried to be because they didn't want to let him know they were on to him. And some of that stuff uh, I found out about, and hopefully you have some as well. Yeah. Uh, that, I mean, that was a common practice and still is, especially in a, you know, a serial homicide investigation. Um, and you said it, you hit the nail on the head. Uh, it was detrimental to the investigation in a lot of ways. Um, the agencies were keeping stuff from one another because yeah. they had that one clue that they figured would tie, you know, back to the suspect, ki- the suspected killer. Um, I- interesting thing uh, that I'm not sure has been publicized much, but it was actually a guy in the coroner's office who, you know, working in the coroner's office as an investigator, you see a lot of bodies. So um, unlike the sheriff or the Glendale PD or the Monterey Park PD, he was involved in all of the cases as far as the autopsies and on scene investigation went. So this guy, his name's Scott Carrier, um, looked at several cases and said, you know, I think that all of these homicides that you're investigating separately are related. Uh-huh. And he told some a couple of sheriff's detectives that and they dug back into other crimes and said, you know what, you're right. And that was the beginning of the Night Stalker task force, probably in July of 85. Okay, I was just going to ask, when about that in, 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 the, in, in, in the timeline of things was that? I mean, did he kind of figure that out early or, you know, were we 10 murders in? Okay, so you say in yeah, July. We, okay. Yeah, I think it was probably about July. So, it, you know, I mean, at least... I want to say five or six murders in because, you know, bulk of a good portion of this case um, happened uh, in, you know, March, April, and May. Uh, And then there was a, I don't believe that there were any homicides or attacks that were committed in June of 85. And then Ramirez picked back up again in um, July. And actually when he came back, uh, when he decided to, uh, Again, again, he was really focused on the San Gabriel Valley. And yes. here, uh, he became known as the Valley Intruder. Right. One of his other, one of his other, uh, in fact, that was the name that law enforcement assigned to him, was the 
Valley yes, Intruder. Yes, which is what I wanted to get into with you. Uh, the name. Okay. Okay, because I, yeah. I, it sounds like you have um, you 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 have uh, the answers and the info that I want on this. Um, uh, and by the way, uh, the, the gap in in in, in um, murders, okay, actual murders that he committed was April fourteenth, nineteen eighty five, um, to June twenty seventh, nineteen eighty five. So yeah, he was almost out of you know commission until the very end of June. Um, then he murders uh, Patty Elaine Higgins, uh, and then July just starts the the seemingly feeling of every other day, every other week um, killings, but. Valley Intruder. Um, I remember even hearing Night Prowler, but eventually, Frank, it becomes Night Stalker. Uh, I believe after he strikes outside of the valley, Frank, who gave him the 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 name Night Stalker? So it's as far as I know, and I believe this story. It was a headline writer at the Herald Examiner by the exactly. name of Dave Barton. Yes, and. Uh, Dave, Dave, I mean, I could tell you all kinds of stories about Dave. He, he, <laughs> first of all, this guy was, I just loved him. Uh-huh. He was smart, smart man, um, who, who, not just smart, but brilliant and really had a great way with, with words. Um, it, it, the Herald Examiner was a lot different than the other newspapers that were circulating then in that it tried very hard to have, uh, be a tabloid. Mm-hmm. Um, without being a tabloid, it was still a broadsheet, you know, um, mm-hmm. hundred point headlines were common. Um, the writing, the, the editors emphasized good writing instead of, um, stenography and, um, headline, the headline writing, uh, team was proficient at puns, wordplay, um, and, and, and encapsulating news stories uh, in a way that uh, wasn't being done elsewhere. And Dave, you know, Dave came up with this Night Stalker and it stuck. Yeah. That, and it, I, I can it, tell you, I, it, it was, it was inspir- I want to say, I want to think, it was inspirational in a way because later on, um, after, you know, the Herald closed and I was working at the San Gabriel Valley Tribune, mm-hmm. there was a, uh, a serial killer that was working in Pomona by the name of the 60 Slayer. Mm-hmm. And, um, he, this guy was preying on prostitutes um, in a very narrow neighborhood, really at Pomona, like around mm-hmm. Holt Boulevard. Right. And, um, and, and we didn't know what to call him. We knew there was a serial killer. So uh, Rick Arthur, uh, who had been um, the sports editor at the Herald, and uh, myself that was covering the case, you know, sat down one afternoon and said, okay, let's go through a bunch of names and come up with one for this guy. And, and we did. And, you know, it was largely because Barton had set the bar with the Night Stalker that we, you know, felt comfortable doing the 60 Slayer. Wow. That's so interesting. Uh, You know, again, my understanding was that um, while while all the uh, uh, attacks, you know, up until a certain point were uh, in, in the San Gabriel Valley, once he had struck outside of the valley and, and it, it really, it must have been the Higgins murder that, that, that did it. They were able to go to uh, the Night Stalker, which gave it more broad. This wasn't just now limited to the San Gabriel Valley. It was, you know, now a, a, a broader area type thing. That opened the door for uh, the Herald to, you know, use that, that headline. Um, and it is very important because he is remembered now in history uh, as the Night Stalker. Um, and well, I think, and then you have the then you have the you know the, the Golden State Killer who's known as the original Night Stalker. Yes, so it even, right. You know, it bled backwards. You know, it, uh, it it and and it's terrifying name. I mean, it goes to that whole idea we were just talking about about the windows being open at night. You know, I mean, right. When there's a guy walking around known as the Night Stalker, it's it's difficult to um, you know envision a world in which you're comfortable leaving your windows open. Right. So, you know what? It wasn't Patty Higgins. Patty Higgins um, was uh, was the second victim, um, or maybe she was the first in Arcadia. She was a special uh, education teacher at, at Brad Oaks Elementary, uh, which is Monrovia Unified, um, and she was in her apartment. 
665 West Naomi Avenue. Uh, my mother lives uh, in that block. This is what I what I talk to people about um, or on that street. Uh, this is what I talk to people about. We all have a story that, that you know, we're like the six degrees of separation. This is more like the two or three degrees of separation. Someone, you know, wow. one, of, one of the murders hit that close to home or, you know, it was a neighbor or it was, you know, somebody you knew. Um, and, and sadly, um, you know, I want to say, Frank, she was uh, uh, 20... In her 20s, um, late 20s, I want to say 28 years old. Um, very, very bad. Uh, anyways, um, so uh, uh, she she is uh, now buried uh, in um, in, in uh, Westmoreland County, uh, Pennsylvania, uh, sadly. So I, I don't think she was from out here to begin with, um, but I could be wrong. Um, anyways, Which Frank. makes okay. it even worse. Makes it, e- makes it even worse. It's just... Yeah. You know, I mean, it's a parent's worst nightmare. Your kids move into some, you know, new place and take on a job and think about it as a career, and you know, you never see them again. Right, which and, is that's uh, you know, just yeah. Right, which is exactly the case now. If we start on the timeline, it, that's exactly the case with uh, the third victim, um, and this one, Frank, uh, really, really uh, hits hits close to home with me. Um, uh, I don't know why, just, uh, this one just really upsets me. Um, this is March 17th, 1985. Uh, her name was Sai Leanne Yu or Veronica Yu. Um, she is killed. She's the second, second victim that night. Um, she is killed driving home. Most reports I read, she's driving home because she's a student at Pasadena, uh, college of uh, art design. Um, others say she was a law student. Uh, be that as it may, um, she was on her way back from school around 10, 1030 at night. Um, and she begins to be followed by Richard Ramirez, who eventually gets her to pull over somehow on Alhambra Avenue uh, in Monterey Park. And he shoots her three times. Um, she She's not dead uh, when the police officer arrives. Um, I, I believe he takes her out of her car. They call the ambulance, and and she either dies on the way to the hospital or she dies before the ambulance gets there. Um, that one really bothers me, Frank, because I lived in that area uh, for a portion of my life, and I drove by there uh, unknowingly um, many, many times. I know exactly where this happened. I mean, it was literally right on the street. Um, that just bothers me. She, she, I, she, I believe she was from Taiwan. Um, she was living in Monterey Park at the time. She wasn't too far from. I think she lived on lived on Newmark. I want to say, um, and you know she's almost home. And this happens, and uh, she's now buried in Taiwan. So I think I think that you know, like the dynamic you just talked about. You send your kid, or your kid goes to you know some new place, and then this happens. I mean, it, it's it's just got to be awful. Um, Previous in the night, Frank, um, uh, uh, he's in Rosemead. A little bit before he had killed Veronica Yu, he's in Rosemead. And yeah, that's same, where... Same night. Yes, yeah, same night. Um, the same like night. Half hour, hour earlier. Uh, Rosemead condo uh, on Village Lane. You can look at it. The building pretty much still looks the same as it did back then. Um, yeah, it, it, it looks exactly the same. Yeah. Um, it, it's exactly, it, yeah. Maria Hernandez, uh, yeah, no problem. Maria Hernandez is coming home from something, um, arrives home to her condo. He follows her into her garage. Uh, she sees him. Uh, she shoots. Uh, he shoots. She raises her hand with her keys in it to deflect, um, the, the, you know, to protect herself and gets very, very lucky. The bullet hits a key. She goes down, acts like she's dead. He goes into the condo. And Dale Okazaki, 34 years old, is um, unpacking groceries, Frank, and you know what happens next. Yeah, well, I mean, this is, uh, you know, he kills her, shoots right. her in the head, and then flees. And he, see, the thing is, is that, I mean, the theory is anyway, is that that wasn't satisfying enough to him. Mm-hmm. And that, that's why he sought out um, the, the other victim in Monterey Veronica Park, you. because it's yeah. only, you know, 
it's not the, it's, yeah, Veronica Yu, it's not that far away from uh, where uh, Dale and Maria live mm-hmm. to uh, to get to, you know, where Veronica Yu's at. And um, this is right and, by and Temple High School. You know, yeah, so, and, and they, you know, this is though where they got the first description of him. Mm-hmm. You know, the rotting teeth, the bulging eyes, the wild hair. Um, and Monterey Park Police, though, I think were largely, well, they largely did a disservice to a lot of the investigation by keeping all the information that they had close. Um, Why would they do that? The, uh, you know, like, well, you know, I mean, it's hard to go back and, and think about what was going on in 85, but I, I imagine that it was because they, they knew this was a violent killer. Uh-huh. And they probably figured that if they kept some of it from being made public, the killer wouldn't know exactly, um, you know, what, what know to, you know, what they knew. Yeah. And, you know, it's interesting. It's the same gun used in both cases, in the Rosemead case and right. the Monterey Park case. 22. Right. Rule 22. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, you know, a, a couple of other, like, just, like, interesting things. The, so he lived in the Cecil Hotel, which is, if you know, um, you know, Sixth and Main, roughly downtown LA. Um, you, you know, shoot down Main Street, just past the Olympic. You can hop on the 10 freeway, which turns into the 60, and within five or six minutes, you're in Rosemead. You know, at ten and nine, ten o'clock at night. Right, and you pop off the freeway that you pop off the freeway at South San Gabriel, uh, right there, and there's the there's that first apartment building, um, and this, by the way, would kind of become a pattern for him. He would, you know, lived at the Cecil. He'd hop down, get up, drive this car, uh, get himself jacked up on uh, usually on crack cocaine and um, and ACDC records, um, and uh, you know head down to uh, the San Gabriel Valley and began to, what he believed he was doing was harvesting people's soul. Uh, you know, he believed he was a disciple of Satan and that uh, when he died, he needed to have several people, uh, the souls of several people who would serve him in death. And there's a whole, you know, there's a whole psychology behind him thinking that, that goes back to his childhood. And, um, uh, it, you know, his he grew up in El Paso, and his brother-in-law was a, um, a Vietnam vet who was pretty messed up. And he would share photos of stuff that he did in Vietnam, which, you know, these gruesome, gruesome decapitations, uh, sexual abuse of, you know, Vietnamese women, um, just these horrible things. And then you'll see there's a pattern in some of Ramirez's crimes where he's preying on uh, Asian women mm-hmm. almost as a way of getting gratification because he was exposed to this stuff at about the same time he was, uh, you know, going through puberty. Um, he witnessed, by the way, uh, the brother-in-law mur- do a murder. And, um, you know, I, and, and the, you know, described later for people that interviewed him that that feeling uh, was something that he never forgot. Really felt it was something that uh, um, that he thought would give him power. And the brother-in-law, what the brother-in-law did was shoot Richard's sister in the face. Right. And uh, and he kept his mouth shut. You know, he kept his mouth. It was yeah, during an argument, a petty shut. argument. Uh, and, and and when he shot yeah. her in the face, and and Richard kept his mouth shut, I guess as far as you know, police right. and stuff like that. Yeah. Okay. But these um, are the same. If you look at these crimes, look at these crimes. They're the same, he's doing the same thing. There's yes. you know shooting people in the face, Asian women involved, uh, yes. sexual gratification, and a ton of uh, drug abuse. Because you know at that time in the eighties, crack cocaine was everywhere and everything right um dale okazaki uh, of rosemead is murdered um frank that one 
you know, really bothers me as well. Uh, it, it, she's she's unpacking groceries, and she's shot in the face after she hears she's hiding after she hears her roommate um, getting what she thinks is shot. She's hiding, and 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 you know, rumor has it or investigation has it, she was unpacking groceries, peeked her head out from around the corner of you know a, a stand in the kitchen, and was just shot between the eyes and. Um, She's dead right there on on her kitchen floor. Uh, I mean, just just ridiculous. Um, so, anyways, uh, you had mentioned um, a, a young woman with her whole life in front of her, right? And that's exactly what happened. Yes, she heard the, what happened in the garage. She hid, peeked out when, when because he he knew she was hiding, and so he got really quiet and just waited. Right. And then, so the original woman who he thinks she killed, he killed uh, Maria Hernandez, tries to run. She goes out in front of the condo. She hears the gunshot uh, killing her friend, um, and he comes out and he sees her again. And for some reason, he doesn't um, he doesn't shoot her uh, again. Uh, you know, he leaves. Um, and this is a pattern that starts to develop. Some people, for some reason, he lets them live. So. We get to May 30th, 1985, and I believe this is when this happens. He's now uh, murdered in, in, in Rosemead, Monterey Park, Whittier, Monterey Park again. Um, and now he rapes Carol Kyle in Burbank. Um, uh, handcuffs her son, puts him in the closet, rapes her. And while this is going down, Frank, uh, and so this is one of these nuggets that I, I think I, I, I found um, on this. Um he, he has a conversation with her, uh, you know, like for 15 minutes. Um, and in that conversation, he says to her, I don't know why I'm letting you live. Uh, I'll have my friends come after you if you call the police, which made me immediately think, and I know this probably isn't true, was he acting alone? Obviously, the murder stopped after he was caught, so very, very likely he was. But I found that to be very interesting. Who were his friends? I mean, the guy was a drifter with, you know, a drug problem, so whatever. Maybe he's just bullshitting. Asks her for directions. You know, how do I... He didn't really know his way around Burbank. How do I get back to the freeway? Um, she gives them to him. But in the description <laughs> that... Yeah, she does. Uh, in, in the description that she gives police... I'm, I'm, um, just, I'm not laughing about that. I'm laughing about not knowing your way around Burbank. Right. Well, <laughs> you know, he <laughs> was from El Paso. The freeway in Burbank. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so... She talks to the police, uh, bad teeth, uh, that's what she tells them. And so uh, uh, it starts to emerge that they have this, um, this guy that one of the things about him is bad teeth. We also get the, the eyes description, um, the, the shaggy hair thing. And Frank, finally, there is a, uh, at some point that summer, a composite sketch that's put out. And, and to this day, Frank, I mean, it's a very looking, very scary looking composite sketch. I will post it with this podcast on Twitter uh, for those that need to be reminded. You probably don't. Frank, that sketch, I, I know they were trying their best, but come on, who the hell looks like that? Do you remember the sketch I'm talking about? <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, I do, actually. There's two of them, by okay. the way. There's not just one, there's two. There's the baseball cap and the sunglasses sketch. Yeah. And then there's the one that, uh, which you're talking about. Yes, right. Uh, you know, I mean, it, it was a it was a different time. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it was a much different time. And uh you know, I mean, it just I just think about it. Like, you know, the, first of all, in that summer, to be clear, Richard Ramirez was not the only serial killer working Los Angeles. Wow. Okay. Uh, the Grim Sleeper. The Grim. The Grim Sleeper was uh, was in the absolute uh, apex of his career as a serial killer in South LA, um, and so was the uh, South Side Slayer. And, wow. Um, you know that just just three. Uh, I know there's a couple others. I can't name them all. Um, so the, there was a. Uh, but LA uh, in 84, 85, even to, you know, as late as 88, was a hub of predators who were killing, uh, doing serial killings. So that said, um, you know, there's a lot of reasons for it. I mean, number one, there was really, 
uh, no DNA uh, to speak of. You know, um, at that time, police matched uh, crime scenes a lot through blood typing, which is, you know, um, it's the difference between, you know, rubbing two rocks together to start a fire and grabbing your bick. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and, and, um, you know, there's also, there's no, no way that there's no video anywhere. There's no way to track people. Um, it, 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 there were, you know, you could be Richard Ramirez and live at the Cecil hotel and pay cash for your rent every day and get in a car and drive around. Nobody knew who, who you were, where you were going, what you were doing or when you were coming back. Right. And, um, and, you know, this is a big, long way of saying that, uh, uh, you know, the, the guys like that could take advantage of, you know, prehistoric police techniques in a way that they, there's no way they could do now. Mm-hmm. Um, it's it just, it's, you know, just a completely different world. Um, and I, you know, I don't know if he instinctively knew that, but, um, you know, he knew enough about evasion and avoidance and uh, what turned him on that, uh, you know, he was able to, you know, slip in and out of people's houses and do some really horrific things. And, you know, the crimes that we're talking about, we're talking about very in a, them in a very, you know, at a very high level, right? Uh, mm-hmm. You know, like shooting somebody. There's there's sexual stuff in a lot of these crimes. Yes. And, um, you know, there's, there's uh, mutilations and there's... Uh, you know, writing in blood on the walls and taunting the police department. I mean, this is like, you know, this is like your B movie serial killer come to life. Mm -hmm. And, um, the, the task force that they put together, they had to put this together because they just couldn't, they can't, they can't do law enforcement, uh, at all. If you, if you're in a situation where you've got somebody who can break into any house at any time and kill anyone with a, a variety of means, you know, people weren't just shot. They were, in one case, he used a machete to kill a couple. Um, and, uh, you know, in, uh, he's the, well, I guess there's all kinds of different classifications for serial killers, but he was a disorganized, uh, killer, um, who, you know, whose disorganization ended up getting the best of them. And, and you know, you, you mentioned this about sharing information. And one of the key pieces of evidence that the police held back was about Richard Ramirez's shoes. They'd taken shoe prints outside of a couple of homes, and they knew that um, it was a specific brand of a specific size and only you know, like maybe a half dozen or a dozen uh, of these shoes had been sold. And um, in the late part of the summer, the Night Stalker decided that L.A. was a little too hot, and he moved up to San Francisco where he killed a couple, uh, Peter Pan and and his wife. And um, the L.A. uh, detectives shared information with the San Francisco detectives about the, the shoe print. And the next day, Mayor Diane Feinstein gives a uh, press conference and gives up the one piece of information that, they, that Richard Ramirez has on him that would allow him to be caught. Yep, brilliant. He's following, you know, he follows uh, <clears throat> the, the news. He's following the news. So he uh, um uh, here's Feinstein's press conference, goes up to the Golden Gate Bridge, takes these shoes that link into this whole string of murders and throws them off the side of the bridge. Yep. And this is why cops are reluctant as shit to give out information to the right. press, especially when they're tracking a savvy serial killer like the Night Stalker. Right, and everybody, that is the voice of Frank Gerardo, true crime writer who were uh, special uh, enough today to have him join us. Um, you can follow him on Twitter at Frank Gerardo, and I will spell that for you guys at F R A N K G I R A R D O T at Frank Gerardo on Twitter. Um, continuing on, Frank, uh, uh, we're talking about the uh, 35 year anniversary of the the horrible summer of the Night Stalker in 1985. Um, and specific to the San Gabriel Valley, of course, 
because that's where we are. Frank, uh, very interesting thing here. Um, he is eventually, after this sketch that we talked about, this scary, awful sketch, which, by the way, is sketched in my mind, um, because, it, you know, that was my, I was, you know, 10, 11 years old at the time, and, and that just scared the shit out of me to see that, that sketch. It was just, you know, too much. Um, very, very scary sketch. It actually really didn't end up looking like it. But nonetheless, it was good enough for a cop who pulled over Ramirez driving a stolen car um, to, 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 to ask him while after he pulls him over, hey, you're not that serial killer guy, are you, that's going around? He has Ramirez outside of the car, Frank, as I'm sure you know, <laughs> outside of the car, and he's going to search the car. And Ramirez takes off on foot, flees, and gets away after he's asked that question. Gets away. Further police search of the car, and I found this very interesting. They find uh, a wallet um, in the car, okay? And uh, inside the wallet is a, uh, is a card that had an appointment card to see a dentist, a guy named Dr. Peter Leung, okay? Um, and... So now they're able to piece together all this stuff about they're hearing about bad teeth. And now this guy that, that they pull over who matches description, you know, has an appointment card for a dentist. And, you know, okay, so now they're piecing together. Wow, same guy, right? You know, uh, he, he's got a dental appointment card, likely the same guy. Um, they go and they, they stake out uh, Dr. Peter Leung's office um, the day of the appointment. But... Um, Ramirez never shows, never shows up to the appointment. I guess maybe he was, like you said, savvy enough uh, at times to, you know, to realize, you know, he's got to cover his tracks and, and you know, they, they maybe got that appointment card and they know where I'm going. And so he doesn't show up. Uh, I found that to be very, very interesting. Uh, that wasn't a question, yeah, but great, I mean, I mean, you know. That's a great little tidbit, um, <laughs> but I'd actually... I'd, I don't know. I'd actually forgotten that. And it's, it's interesting. Uh, it, it's interesting for, for two reasons. One, it shows that cops are not geniuses. Uh -huh. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, as much superpowers as we want to give to, you know, the, the police, sometimes, you know, they just don't possess them. Sure. Um, and, and two, uh, at least they were smart enough on the back end to realize that, Hey, this could be the guy. Let's go wait outside his, his dentist's office. Um, you know, it, it, uh, turns out though that he was, he was slippery, just a slippery dude, but they, you know, um, they had, they had a lot of feelers out for him everywhere throughout the valley, mm -hmm. everywhere. And, uh, it was not going to be, uh, you know, like I said, I mean, he knew it, he followed this and he followed it in the Herald. And um, probably the LA Times and certainly the San Diego Valley Tribune and the Pasadena Star News, um, which were, you know, actively uh, covering the case, whether they called him the Night Stalker, the Valley Intruder, or, you know, in the case of the state of Los Angeles Times, a, you know, uh, multiple uh, suspected alleged multiple murderer mm -hmm. without a name. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um Frank, do you do you have any idea? Yeah. Uh, do you have any re remembrance of, of that story I just told? Where where that was? Where the cop had pulled him over and and he got away? I, I want to know what city that was. I, I, I have a hard time. I want to know what city that was. Where? You no, know, I think I, you know. I honestly, I I, I honestly think it was LAPD, um, but I, I okay. want to commit to that. I do remember hearing that story. Okay. Um, Interesting. Okay, uh, but I'll be darned if I can remember what city it was in. Because uh, you know, Frank, like I said at the top of the show, everyone in the San Diego yeah, Valley, in the Valley. Well, everyone in, in the San Diego Valley that you talk to has a story about. Oh, he was on my street. The cops almost caught him one night. Uh, my that brother's sisters. Him? What's that? Okay, I'm sorry if, if everybody caught some uh, little uh, technical difficulty there, but we are still with Frank Gerardo, um, true crime author, talking about the Night Stalker summer of 1985, 35 years ago. Um, Frank, you, you have a, a little memory collection like we were talking about of, of the cop who actually had Ramirez uh, 
pulled over and, and let him uh, get away uh, that I was just talking about? Yeah, I do. Actually, I do remember it. It was an LAPD motorcycle cop that pulled him over. Okay. And, you know, you know, motorcycle cops are uh, typically the most of police officers you can ever run into. This is, I'm serious about this, by the way. They're and, the most what um, Fun. They're always oh, fun. Most okay. people cops are fun. Yeah, okay. And uh, so, you know, cop walks up to the car, jokingly asks, are you this night stalker everybody's looking for? Ha ha, nope. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Whoops. Well, that bye. guy's got a story um, to this day. All right. Yeah. Yeah, he does. Yeah. Um, <laughs> he sure he does. Okay, so uh, Frank, the, the the point of that though was that there were a lot of stories like that. I remember we were living in San Marino at the time, and, and San Marino residents, you know, uh, uh, several friends, whatever. I remember the parents of friends talking about how they they had him on Huntington Drive. You know, they had saw him and he got away and 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 like this and that. And I think every city. I mean, come on, he was in San Marino. I mean, possible. Uh, I think he was probably everywhere at one point, but, you know, possible but not likely. But nonetheless, that was the point. Like, the hysteria was that, Frank, you know, no matter who you talk to, the, the Night Stalker was on their street, you know, um, was, was was you know, was just almost apprehended. Someone saw him. You know, cops didn't get there soon enough. I mean, I think that was more the hysteria involved than actual reality. But I could be wrong. Probably was, but the cops ran down every lead that they had. Okay. And they, you know, um, they got lots of those calls. People saw him everywhere. You know, um, saw him at the group. You can, you know, imagine it, right? Now every time you see a Karen, you pull out your cell phone. But yeah. then anytime you saw the Night Stalker, you called the police. And police throughout the Valley, even L.A., um, were flooded with calls about Richard Ramirez. Um, okay. But, you know, the thing is, is that he wasn't out during the day. Right. You know, he was a, he was a, a night person. And, okay. um, and And he was out at night. And he was following, you know, his own exploits uh, in the in the paper. He read the paper, you know, uh, religiously. Um, uh, and. True or false, Frank, uh, the cops had. Um plainclothes officers riding around um, neighborhoods on bikes, um, actual set up uh, uh, staged houses with intentional, um, you know, obvious door or window open uh, type things trying to catch this guy during that time. Is, is that true or false? That's true. Wow. Amazing. Oh boy! Listen, He's... the the, the lead, lead detective Gil uh, Carrillo, yes, uh, lives in the San Gabriel Valley. Yep, uh, to this day, yep. and um, he he told me one time that uh, and when this thing was heating up, and he had, was going out on calls in the middle of the night, his wife was so scared that she told him like, "Hey." listen, I'm not going to live in our house anymore. I'm going to need to get out and take the kids and go stay with my parents until this is over. And she did. That's what she did. And, and she wasn't alone. I mean, people, you know, had this fear of him uh, that, you know, caused him to do things that, uh, you know, they might not do if it was, you know, just a random cat burglar. You know, Carrillo had a partner, I can't remember her last name, Linda something, also on the investigation, uh, lived in Monterey Park. Uh, she is uh, sleeping uh, one night during, uh, you know, the height of all this, and she hears um, her neighbor calling to her in the middle of the night. Uh, neighbor is Sophie Dickman. This is July 7th, 1985. He's already killed Joyce Nelson in Monterey Park that night sadly leaving the Avia shoe print on her face, okay, um, just brutal. But nonetheless, um, same night, Sophie Dickman, this is like at 3 a.m., uh, is someone enters her home, ties her up, rapes her, ties her uh, to like the post of her bed, uh, beats her, doesn't kill her, and she's yelling for hope, uh, help. One of the neighbors, you know, calls uh, this lady, Linda, I can't remember her name, says so-and-so is calling your name 
So she goes to, you know, out like her back door, front, you know, whatever, and, and she hears her. She says, Sophie, you know, what's wrong? What's what's going on? This woman's across the street uh, from her bedroom, is yelling to her, I've just been attacked. You know, he was just here, you know, this and that, you know, and, 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 she, and I'm tied to my bed. I need help. I need you to come get me. I mean, that's the kind of stuff that was happening. I mean, that's how close to home it was hitting. Um that's that's just insane. Yeah, so I mean that that's Deputy Linda Arthur. Uh, okay, she was sheriff's deputy. Her husband was a sheriff's deputy. He'd actually been killed in the line of duty, wow. and um, I think earlier that year, if I don't, if I remember right, um, Creo's partner on the case though was was a guy by the name of Frank Salerno. Yes, and uh, Frank's a, like a kind of a legend among uh, homicide detectives, especially in LA County. Yes. Uh, it, that, I mean, boy, he's got some wild stories. I was I was lucky enough to uh, be able to interview him a couple of times um, when he was still a detective uh, prior to his retirement, and um, you know, just just you know, this guy was was you know, along with Carrillo, the two best detectives you could want on this case. Uh, there's nobody like Gil Carrillo when it comes to like just tracking somebody down. And and it's not just that though. People when they meet Gil, they'll tell him stuff. They will tell him everything, right? Because because you see, he's a big, he's a huge guy, like six yeah. six, yeah, big big man. Yeah. But he's so he's got such a gentle demeanor that uh, you know if you've done something something wrong, uh, you'll come and confess to Father Gil. Yeah. Um, well, and, and and feel good about it when you're done. Ramirez told him that he had a fetish for Asian women. Loved him. I mean, just out and and you yeah. can see it in the sickness. You want an interesting story about Frank Salerno? Like you said, uh, one of the victims of the Night Stalker, Whitney Bennett, 16 years old at the time, living in Sierra Madre. Um, she breaks in. Uh, he he breaks. She's sleeping. He breaks into her room. Okay, beats her with a tire iron, ties her up. She doesn't die. He leaves. She tries to make it to her parents' uh, bedroom. She doesn't remember all that happened um, because of, you know, this horrible beating she gets, drifting in and out of consciousness. Um, the parents are able to get to her. They call police and, um, and, and you know, uh, uh, paramedics. Um, they put four feet of sutures in her head uh, to get things closed up. Four feet, according to Frank Salerno. She is now married to Frank Salerno's son, Whitney Bennett, victim of the Night Stalker. How about that? That that's that is a true story. Very yeah. true story. A little bit of good information for your uh, for your listeners. And yeah. um, you know uh, what happened to her was horrific, horrific. Yeah, terrible. And uh, um, yeah, just this is the but this, this this you know. You hate to say this, and yet it's true. Uh, Richard Ramirez was an animal. You know, he was. Uh, he, was just, he, he was a psychopath, uh, and he was, you know, way out on the spectrum. Uh, yeah. And this, you know, this psychopathology, you know, wasn't just, you know, just that, which might be treatable, but it was that plus, you know, a serious cocaine addiction plus a love of stuff like acid and, you know, other you know, mind altering, uh, chemicals that, uh, you know, fueled his psychosis. Yeah. And I, I don't really, I know in, in cases like this, everyone does try and find motive and reason. Um, I think this guy was just a stupid fuck and, 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 and he was a loser and evil and, and, and there really is nothing more to it. I, I Frank, I, I don't think he could have told you who he was going to murder that night, the morning that it happened. I think he just went out random prowling. And sadly, if you were one of the people whose houses he stumbled upon and it had an opening, um, you may have been, you know, one of his victims. I, I think that's the, that's the end of it. Nothing, nothing too, you know, dynamic about this guy other than that. Um, just, yeah, I, just, think, I think that's true. I mean, yeah. I, I just, I think that's true. I, I wouldn't want to ascribe anything, you know, any like supernatural powers or, you know, any, anything else. I mean, I, I do think though that he's evil. Uh, I mean, very evil, as evil as you can get. 
Um, I think, you know, there's this psychopathology that's at play and, uh, you know, and add the drugs in and you get, you know, you get what you get. You get a, a string of uh, robberies, homicides, and sexual assaults that, uh, you know, so gruesome that a lot of this stuff we we will never talk about in polite society. Right. It's um, that bad. It's that bad. Yeah, you're right. A hundred percent right. Um, he, uh, he, he continues on after Frank, you know, it kind of mentioned the, um, the, the murder in San Francisco. He comes back here. I believe he, he strikes again in mission Viejo, um, uh, attempted murder on, on William Carnes. Uh, it was Inez Erickson, William Carnes' wife slash girlfriend. Man, now you're you're getting in the Orange County stuff, and I'm a little bit I'm a little less uh, apt to um, to say I can name the Orange County stuff. I do think though that the end of his spree was in Orange County. Yeah, Michigan and if VA. I'm not mistaken, yeah, if I'm not mistaken, um, he there was an attempted burglary uh, that he was part of, and a 13 year old boy, uh, you know, rushed out of the house. Or looked out the window, saw a car, got a license plate. Um, police found the car abandoned. They got a fingerprint out of it, and it was that fingerprint that linked them to Correct. Richard Ramirez. And and when they when they got him, you know, they replaced the the drawing with an actual photo. Right. And this this like. This is an iconic, you know, to this day, an iconic East L.A. moment. Hmm. You know, Ramirez, even though he lived in, uh, you know, in the Cecil Hotel downtown, he spent a lot of time on the east side in, um, in Boyle Heights, uh, which is, you know, um, in the city of Los Angeles, and then uh, and East L.A., which is in, the, you know, L.A. County. And so he goes into a, a liquor store, that he frequented to buy uh, candy and he's buy, buying candy for those rotten he's, teeth. He's got a horrible sweet tooth. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. 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 Well, I mean, you know, so he's buying candy for those rotten teeth. Uh, the, uh, there's a couple of, uh, you know, people see him in the liquor store and they, they, you know, shout out, El Matador, El Matador. You know, right. that means the murderer, the killer. Mm-hmm. He looks down at the, if, you know, you know how it is in those old liquor stores. You'd have a yep. rack of newspapers there, yep. Yep. and so he looks down. Here's a rack of newspapers, and staring up at him from, you know, the pages of the Herald Examiner and the San Gabriel Valley Tribune, and probably the LA Times. Uh, although we can't be certain that they put it on A1, uh, <laughs> was his photo. Uh huh. <laughs> That's a newspaper industry joke, <laughs> although I'm sure many people get it. All right. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah it was, it's, his, it's his photo. And, uh, you know, the, the guy that, uh, that owns the store, um, you know, turns, you know, says, ah, looks at him, sees it, sees it. He's see, looking at himself. They look at each other. There's this moment of panic, I think, by the liquor store owner. And certainly from Ramirez, he goes running out of the store. Yeah. I remember I, the, the store is on Hubbard and Hubbard runs between Boyle Heights and, um, and East LA. Mm-hmm. And so he actually runs from LAPD area into the sheriff's area. Right. Um, and, and then, and he, you know, he's trying everything. You know, the more and more people on the street are, you know, like they know who he is and they're going to catch him. And let me tell you, East LA justice is not some justice that you want to receive. Right. And, um, and, you know, he's trying to break into cars, he's throwing people around, he's, you know, he's he's in the fight of his life. And, you know, neighbors beat the shit out of him. Good. And the, and the sheriff, sheriffs roll up, and they cuff him, mm-hmm. put him on the curb. And, you know, this is going to be a triumphant moment for the uh, the sheriff's department right. because, you know, they piece this story together. Gil and, Gil and, and Frank right. piece this great thing together. They've got, now they've got a sheriff's deputy who's cuffed this guy. This is and, a great uh, story. LAP, yeah. LA, LAPD rolls up and sticks him in the back of the of their police car. <laughs> right. Drives him, drives him down to Parker Center and yeah. you know, makes the announcement, hey, we caught the night stock. Right. Yeah, and the, and the <laughs> sheriffs just went to pieces. And it was, it was a rookie sheriff, I want to say, who released him from sheriff's custody 
to LAPD. You know, this would have been a been yep. big grandiose moment for, you know, whoever is seen as the apprehending party. But yeah, like you said, yeah. LAPD intercepts him. And, and, and Tom Bradley uh, also goes down to Parker Center for no other reason other than photo op. He said he was down there to, to calm community tensions. Tom Bradley's the mayor of the mm. time, but he was down there because he wanted to, you know, uh, you know, also associate with the, the capture of the guy. Um, and, the, and, and Gil Carrillo said that the sheriffs legitimately were pissed off at that, that deputy who let him out of his custody and let, let, let the LAPD take him. Yeah, of course they were. I yeah. mean, every right to be, too. I mean, it was their case. They made it. They yeah. made the case. LAPD didn't make the case. LAPD had let him go just a few yeah. weeks earlier. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's legit. I, I, I'll tell you, you know? Frank, you know, the, the the last victim, you know, not, I know we're jumping around here. The last victim was a guy named Bill Carnes and his girlfriend, Inez Erickson, in Mission Viejo. He shot Carnes three times. Carnes didn't die. Um Erickson, he raped. She, she, she was not killed either. Um, I saw a piece done by the LA Daily News. I believe it was the LA. Daily, it could have been the Register on him checking in with this Bill Carnes gentleman. Many years later, he lives out of state now. Um, he he doesn't have all of his mental faculties. He I think he has to have some sort of assistance uh, with his living. Um, he basically lays on his bed all day. Not that he can't go out and do things he's not an invalid but he's just you know spends a lot of time on his bed reminiscing has the same bed okay i think i don't want i don't know where he lives utah now or something like that same bed from that night um and a picture of him and inez erickson as a couple you know together um above the bed uh she since left him though she left him though um some years after that um, she got shot, didn't I mean, I think they both got shot, right? If I'm not uh, mistaken. I mean, he got... I just have her as raped, um, but but uh, he was uh, shot three times in that. Horrible enough. Yeah, yeah. That, yeah, horrible enough. And, and she left him. Poor woman. Um, you know, and it probably... this. So this guy basically is stuck, Frank, on that night. And it's very sad, you know? Uh, uh, and still hanging on to, to her, or the memory of her and him together. And, and I mean... So they didn't die, but their lives are ruined. Um, and and yeah, this their lives are ruined. goes back to just the horror and, and just the complete just debauchery of, of this situation. And, and hopefully, Frank, we never see another one like it. Hopefully. Uh, you know, I mean, it, it's, uh, it was a weird time in L.A., a weird time. I, I don't know how else to describe it. Yeah, and um, um, and a weird time, really, in in our history. Yeah, um, and I imagine that there's there are kids today who are exposed to violence, and uh, you know, and inured to uh, it in a way you know that could affect them. Yes. but you know, there's there's I think there's no way that they could go on a on a crime spree like like Ramirez did with all the technology that we have. Yeah, like, I guess that's the impossible. good thing about it. Yeah, uh, cameras everywhere and, and DNA stuff. Um, you know, you'd like to think this, this if it took place today, would have been wrapped up much sooner. Um, I mean, just think, just, think about the, just think about the traffic stop. I mean, cops now have, yeah. you know, cameras. So yeah. here, you know, stop the guy, you turn the camera on, talk to him for a while. I mean... Yeah. Now you've got a snapshot, you've got facial software, facial recognition software, and, uh, you know, I mean, just that alone, that encounter, that one encounter, uh, would have, you know, knocked off, you know, maybe a third of this crime spree. Yeah, so, maybe he knows uh, the, the car is stolen before he ever gets out or gets off his bike, and, he's, and, he, and, he's, yeah. and, he, and he takes him um, into a, a, a custody right away rather than stand over there while I search and wait for your plates to come back. I don't so, know. so we're all, you know, all this technology, you know, um, that probably at the end of the day, you know, prevents guys like this from doing what they're doing, at least here. I mean, I'm sure there's other places in the world where, um, you know, uh, technology isn't as, uh, as, as prevalent. 
and uh, boy, and you know these are crimes of oppor- these are crimes of opportunity. Like you know, just think about describing the cops that you know stay in the house with the door unlocked and the window open because they yeah. know this is a guy looking for opportunity, right? Right. So, yeah, Frank. Uh, uh, that all of this, all of this is not to say that I endorse uh, a surveillance state. I'm just saying it's a fact. Right. One. Right. Yeah, yeah, we got to find a balance, of course. Yeah, um, yeah. Frank, last question. Uh, we talked about you know the day that he's caught and and all that. Um, do you remember what you felt that day? Uh, do you remember maybe better than I did? Because like I said, I remember the the exhale that I gave and the oh my god, it's over. And I kind of didn't even believe it. And I I think I kept asking my mom, "Is it really him? How do we know it's him? Is it safe tonight to start sleeping with our windows open oh, again?" Really? Not that I remember if we did. But do you remember since Those you were really a little good. older than me? <laughs> were you, when, when, do you remember when, when since you were a little older than me? I know there was a huge celebration in East LA. Do you remember what the vibe was across the city that that night, August thirty first? By the way, yeah, the I, anniversary is coming I, up. I do. Okay, tell me and everyone, I do. please. Very well. Yeah, uh, I, people were people. You know, were ecstatic. Like, hey, this guy's off the street. We can. It's safer outside. And there, it was definitely, it was real. And you talked about it and you it, uh, never forget. I don't forget that day. I mean, you know, people talk about Kennedy assassination and uh, the challenger and, you know, these things are real and you don't, and you don't forget them. And this is in that same kind of category. If you lived here at that time mm-hmm. and um, yeah, it, uh, I think, you know, it, I lived in a, so I lived in Pomona, mm-hmm. uh, uh, in, in that August. And I lived in a neighborhood that was, um, well, it was a, a, a drug neighborhood. I don't know how else to describe it. There were gang members, you know, if you've ever seen the, if you've ever seen the wire, I lived in a neighborhood that was a lot like the wire. They okay. were, you know, they were slinging on, they were slinging on the corner and, okay. um, you know, it wasn't unusual. Uh, if you did sleep with your windows open at night, it wasn't unusual to hear gunfire. Um, yeah. you know at that time um but uh you know that was something you could always navigate right <laughs> but you couldn't navigate the night stalker and that's why i think it, it's so profound of an experience in terms of what you remember you know from that summer like not just the fact that there was this fear in everybody's home but there was a sense as you described it and i think it was very well your description was really apt the sense of elation like hey Yes, there's that, still that trepidation. Like, is it the right guy? Can we sleep with the windows open? But I think, right. I, I think the fact that we had this reassurance from the, you know, officials that hey, this is the guy. We know it's him. Uh, you know, made for a nicer September and October, which are always really hot. Um, yeah. <laughs> but like I told you at the very beginning of this, there are still times when I'm asleep, going to bed at night, and debating whether or not I should open the window. Hundred uh, percent in my bed in my bedroom, just simply because of that summer. Hundred percent, yeah, yeah, I, I agree. And and everybody out there listening, we want to hear your stories, your memories of that. Like I said, I will start a thread, you know, a, 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 just a tweet linking to this podcast, which is hopefully where you're going to hear this. And then please tell us what you know your memory of that day when he was caught August 31st, 1985 or, or something from that summer. Um, uh, really, really interesting to always hear these stories, um, uh, much like the one Frank and, and I just shared, um, Frank, uh, uh, you're a true jewel, man. Um, uh, uh, the, 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 you know, the true crime savant of the SGV and beyond, man. Um, you really brought it today. Uh, Nobody better to relive this with uh, than you, um, uh, sadly, if it has to be relived. Um, and so I, I thank you for coming on today. Hey, Aaron, thanks for having me. Love your podcast. Uh, I especially loved uh, the Greg Gano's uh, uh, two-parter. <laughs> but um, I, th- I, I think that this is... Uh, uh, I, I think this is important. I think people in the Valley need to, you know, uh, the people that weren't here then sure would like to hear this story. And I'm glad that we got to relive it together. Yeah, yeah, me too. Um, thank you, Frank. I appreciate it. And uh, I, I will see you out there in social media world. Yes, sir. Uh, yep. Yeah, I hope to talk to you again soon, Aaron. Thank you. Uh-
All right, Frank, take care. Frank Gerardo, what can you say? Like I said, he is uh, um, nobody better true crime-wise um, uh, than Frank and just some amazing memories of, of this Night Stalker tragedy. Um, I don't know any other way to describe it. I mean, um, very, very scary, sad times here uh, in the SGV 35 years ago. Like I said, please share at Chemical AT on Twitter. Uh, please share your memories. I, I know a lot of people like to do that um, when this topic comes up, so it shouldn't be that hard. want to hear what you have to say, um, and I thank you for listening today. Bye-bye.